we appear to be live. Um, welcome. It's Sunday, March the 15th, the Ides of March. Um, we were just briefly talking before I went live on Facebook uh, about the uh, COVID-19 coronavirus and the effect that it's having on us. This is a really good opportunity as Gurdjieffians to really look at our subconscious fears, to look inside ourselves. Um, it's not deadly for basically those under the age of 80, less so those under the age of 60, but it certainly is devastating the economy. Just briefly, all sorts of people that I know have been laid off. Um, I'm a hypnotherapist. My own client list begin is starting to flatten. I'm not getting as many phone calls or emails. Um, I'm not really worried about it. I have enough reserves to uh, um, sort of uh, make it through this period. Um, Ian, your your bed and breakfast. Um, that's a huge source of your income um, in Portland. How, how is the how are things in Portland itself? Um, are, there, are there a lot of infections? Are there I guess you don't have the kits uh, from what we're reading down in the States to really test people. Yeah, my, I don't, my own experience, you know, speaking what I know to be true, I, there doesn't seem to be much going on. I don't, there, people seem to be staying home. The streets are quieter. Yeah. I haven't heard of anybody getting sick. I haven't seen anybody who's sick. Um, my cousin in California works in healthcare and she's been quite concerned about the level of preparedness or the lack, the lack thereof. Yeah. Um, so, so far on the streets, things seem to be not so bad. Um, but personally, with the, with the, tr you know, being part of the travel industry, um, we don't have anyone booked now for the rest of the month. We've had over 10 cancellations in the past week, um, including this morning, I think our, one of the bookings we had for April is now, has now canceled. Um, so, we're, we're in a bit of a pickle. Um, and I know, I'm, I mean, we've talked about in the past how financial trouble really sends me into a this tailspin yeah. panic spiral. Um, so I've been, I've been making use of this by trying to maintain a level of distance from the panic without, um, you know, trying to hide, hide it from myself. I don't know if I'm frozen. You guys. Yeah, to... But what we heard you, your, your voice kept okay. on going. So. Okay. Good. Good. Um, um, so yeah, just being able to kind of, you know, I mean, the, the phrase I go back to is non-expression of negative emotions. I got a lot of negative emotions, but I'm trying not to express them. I'm trying not to let them take over um, because I see how, how much is needed of me right now. Yeah. And explore options and, remember to write to the landlord, remember to keep trying to pay the bills and remember I, you know, I can't check out today. I have to go do other work and I have to find other options. I just got to stay on, 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 and I don't have time. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know where the quote is. I think it's in views from the real world um, where Mr. Gurdjieff talks about how uh, this was back in like 1915, 1920 that people were infected with anxiety and fear. And the doorman fears the, you know, tenant, and the tenant fears the doorman, and, you know, everyone, you know, we walk around in this state of anxiety. And I know that uh, for a huge portion of my life, my biggest boogeyman was finances. Um, you know, the world is going to collapse, the sky is going to fall, and the amount of emotional energy that I've invested over the decades in a fear of finances. And I know part of it comes from my mother. Uh, she was raised by a single mother during the depression, four children. Um, my mother would uh, wash her paper towels and reuse them again. And yet I've never been homeless. I've never not had food in my fridge, food on my shelves. And the amount of psychic energy that I've spent in fear of money has been 
You know, it's phenomenal. It was one of those places to observe and kind of poke fun at myself and laugh and say, you know, chill out. This is, you know, you're, you're not going to fall off that financial cliff. I, I never have. I've, like I said, I've never, you know, I've, I've gotten down to my last $1,000, uh, but I've never been homeless. I've never not had food. And the amount of energy and thoughts that I've had, it's just way out of proportion. But we're in these new times now um, with a new virus that uh, humanity hasn't experienced before. And for most of us, it's just going to be a mild kerfuffle and it won't really have any kind of an effect on us. But if we look at the larger statistics, you know, a country like Canada with 35 million people, if every single person in Canada was infected with the COVID-19, according to the statistics, there would be approximately 900,000 people dying. Uh, if everyone in America, 335 million people were infected, um, I think they would be talking something like 30 million people dying, um, which is a significant number of people. But most of the people who have the potential to die, you know, are people who are over the 80, people with compromised immune systems, people with two or three different existing conditions, say, you know, asthma and diabetes or hypertension. Um, so it really has the potential to reshape our society in many different ways. Um, how are in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, Brian, how are things over there? Um, I guess the heat and the warmth and... Uh, um, <laughs> Um, as I said, I went to the grocery store yesterday, and it was definitely as busy as I've ever seen it. Uh, but I personally, I'm just, um, you know, I think that there's still a lot of hype, you know, in the, the media that's stirring up all the fear that's not necessary and actually causing a lot of problems. You know, for me, myself, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have, I'm not scared of it. I actually, and it might be weird, I, uh, I'd be interested in what you think, but I find some excitement in the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> And, uh, you know, um, seeing people, some people are awaking from sleep a little bit and they, um, you know, to see people out of their comfort zone to me seems like a good thing. And, um, you know, there's just some excitement about the unknown that for me, I kind of enjoy. Um, and I know that, you know, financially, obviously there's some, there might be some issues, but I've never really been one to really stress over finances and I always feel like you know I'll always in some way or another be okay so I'm kind of just sitting back and observing everything and you know I'm not uh, not too stressed about it uh, I mean it's certainly an opportunity to uh, uh, watch a degree of mass hysteria just yeah. mildly, mildly forming and uh, um, also getting an opportunity to bring the fear uh, to the surface uh, um, one, one other thing I've actually, um, Friday and Saturday, I kind of just, I live right in downtown Scottsdale. So I would kind of like walk through the streets and just kind of hear what people were talking about. And I'd go to the coffee shop. I'd just sit there and, um, kind of just like listen to the conversations. Um, and just to get more of like a firsthand perspective on, you know, what people, like the mood of the people. Um, and I, I can only think that's going to get more and more interesting as, as things get a little bit more intense. Well, well, what are you picking up on? Um, just that for the most part, from what I'm seeing in people's just normal conversations, they don't really seem, you know, too worried about it. Um, you know, that's why in the news, it seems like everyone's all panicking, but if you actually go out and this and see people. I mean, everyone seems like they're in a pretty good mood. And like, yeah. I don't see any difference. Yeah. I mean, it's not really going to affect most people. Uh, yeah. It'll just be this little thing that, that flows through them if they catch it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that here in Canada, we have socialized health care. So it doesn't cost me a penny to go visit my doctor or go to the hospital. It pay, we pay for it through taxes. 
but you know, I have my health card with my photo ID on it. And, uh, they're afraid that if everyone gets it at once, the health care system is going to collapse and that's their big fear. So they're trying to flatten it, um, by, you know, this social distancing and shutting down sporting events and places where people gather and congregate. And here in Toronto, they're shutting down universities museums, um, all the places owned by the city, the various attractions, they just, they, they want to flatten it. So you can still, you may still get sick, but rather than in the next month, maybe in six months, so that the healthcare system is not overloaded. And that's where the big fear comes in. Um, once the healthcare system is overloaded, then people who say are suffering heart attacks or have the normal illnesses that bring them into hospitals, uh, they're not going to be the doctors. They're not going to be the beds. Um, they're, they're talking about how 5% of people who do come down with it are actually going to lose the ability to breathe. And so they're going to need ventilators um, if what is going on in China is true. So at the, the level of the healthcare system, it has the potential to wreak um, tremendous harm. Um, for the rest of us, you know, for people in school, it may seem like a nice vacation. Um, you know, elementary schools are getting closed here, um, universities, uh, various different things. So a lot of people are going, ah, but then, you know, a lot of people are being sent from home, uh, sent, you know, from work. And so they're going to get maybe two weeks pay and then they're going to be sort of dangling and it depends how long this lasts. So. You know, this is it's an interesting time. It really is to for for observation of humans, for observation of ourselves, for you know, looking at our own emotional state, looking at our own thoughts, for looking at our own interactions and the way um, we connect with people. Um, I met someone last night. I had met them before. You know, I had an appointment with them. We shook hands, and as soon as we were shaking hands, we were going, oh. We should have been fist bumping, shouldn't we? You know, it was just so automatic. And then um, two seconds later, his wife was there, and then she and I did the elbow bump. <laughs> um, and it's just, you know, it, that, that makes you just bring you into the present moment. Oh, you know, this, Mr. Gurdjieff talked about automatic behaviors, and there are certain behaviors that they're at such a subconscious level, we're not really aware of them. And one of them is shaking hands. Uh, Milton Erickson learned that if someone reaches towards you, he would grab the hand, put it back to your face and say, go into a trance. And if you broke this whole automatic movement, which let's say there are 20 steps involved in the shaking of someone's hand. And it's such an automatic subconscious routine that when Milton Erickson interrupted it, he was able to put people into trances. It's called the handshake induction just taking the hand, flipping it around and going, look at your hand and go into a deep trance. So just that last night, realizing the automatic process, you know, I rang the doorbell, he opened the door and I shook his hand and then we went, whoops. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, an opportunity to really begin to observe ourselves and begin to to look at our own automatic behaviors, to look at our own fears, to begin to examine um, the mass hysteria that may or may not arise. Um, I don't think we're going to experience mass hysteria, but I think we're going to see a lot of weird behavior from people um, hiding away in their apartments, which people are supposed to do if they feel ill, if they have a fever. Um, they're supposed to self-quarantine, self-isolate for two weeks. Um, so, you know, there's going to be a lot of fodder for observation, a lot of, uh, you know, um, food for thought. And uh, any further comments on this before we get sort of to the regular meeting? Uh, you know? yeah. At any rate, you know, uh, my prayers are with you, Ian. Hopefully everything will be over much quicker. There's going to be a lot of economic instability and, you know, people who are like you, very directly tied into the tourism industry. Um, and for me, you know, clients, people don't have to come and see a hypnotherapist during these downturns. It's, you know, this July and August when it's beautiful out, my business drops anyways. 
Uh, so I'm kind of used to a roller coaster ride. I suppose you are too, but you know, you were in the low point and you should have been coming up and it's just staying flat. Yes. And, um, so we're going to see a lot of shakeup in a lot of industries, the airline industry, travel industry, you know, people have been having very thin margins and everything. They might not be able to survive it. And so we could see this massive transfer of wealth and, you know, and, uh, companies going bankrupt and other people walking in and buying the stuff for 10 cents on the dollar and starting up again and doing all sorts of things. So just, it'll be interesting to watch how this ripples through the economy, ripples through our life. And uh, so um, any reflections on any kind of inner work that uh, any questions on the inner work that you may have had uh, observations? Um. One thing that we just had some uh, some new neighbors move in next door, and they're the most like um, I don't know. They're pretty brutal, and it's causing me to do a lot of inner work um, just with the constant noise. I mean, I had my neighbors for the past ten years. They didn't even live there, and they would come in uh, maybe three weekends a year. Never saw them, and it was great. <laughs> the new ones um it's a family and they have dogs that bark at me every time i open uh and close my back door and um they're just loud and they were up late last night and they just moved in last month and then um but it's the same thing it just um it gives me an opportunity to uh yeah do some inner work and just kind of deal with it and observe and it's not i'm let, not letting it get to me at all but um i think for a lot of people that um, in the same situation would, uh, you know, they would really let it affect them and they would, you know, it would cause a lot of problems in their life. Uh, so, I, I mean, do you notice any kind of emotions arising? Um, um, and the dog, the little dog, it's like a little chihuahua. Okay. That barks throughout the day. Um, I, I just, I get annoyed at it. Like, I'm not angry. You know, it's not, I don't let it upset me, but it's definitely annoying. Um, and that's really the emotion, just annoyance. Annoyance. Um, annoyance is anger. So it's, it's, it's a sort of a subset of anger. Um, yeah. so, uh, there's one, you know, practice opposite to emotion. When you get angry, the opposite of anger is, um, uh, what's the opposite of anger? Love, love. Um, hey, little chihuahua. Have you tried to befriend the chihuahua? Uh, uh, I've not. They're, they're not that friendly to strangers, but uh, you, know, you know, I'd be tempted to throw a piece of cheese or something out and you know to get it uh so that it begins to like me and not get upset at me but you never know chihuahuas are strange um yeah, good idea. yeah good good opportunity to observe yourself um mr gurdjieff also said uh you know practice love on animals first uh it's easier to do with animals so maybe try and practice opening yourself up you know a little bit of love at least in terms of your energy to the chihuahua see if it affects the chihuahua be an interesting experiment um uh, okay uh let me just uh pull up whoops and just uh, you know the recognition that we're doing this work for ourselves for humanity and for the earth herself working along all Three lines. Mr. Gurdjieff's vow, I wish to be, I can be, I have the right to be, I have the ability to be. I swear to myself that this will never be for my personal profit, but to help others. I wish to be, to help others. This is to be understood as a vow. So let's just begin by becoming aware of the effect of gravity on our body. Noticing how gravity is pulling us down, those pressure points perhaps underneath our feet, under our thighs, our sitting bones, maybe the uh, lower back, uh, 
where we're pushed down by the effects of gravity. And then become aware of the nature, the perception, the sensation of balance within you. Notice how your head balances on your neck, on your spine, how that balances on your shoulders, your shoulder blades, your rib cage, your breastbone, how all of that balances on your spinal column, particularly the lower parts of your spinal column, which balance on the pelvic bones. And then become aware of the atmospheric pressure around you. Try to sense the pressure of the air pushing against your body. And then become aware of the temperature of the air surrounding you. And then move inwards and try to become aware of your own internal temperature, perhaps in your forehead. And then move inside your mouth and become aware of the inside of your mouth, the roof of your mouth, your tongue, the flesh underneath your tongue. And then move down to the back of your mouth, down your awareness into your throat. Become aware of the main muscles involved in swallowing. Become aware of the inside of your throat. And then move down into your esophagus, the part that connects your throat to your stomach. And then move down and become aware of your stomach. And then from your stomach, perhaps expand your awareness into your abdomen. Maybe even become aware of your bladder, your colon. Just try to do a general internal sensation of your body. Just try to sense your body, the flesh within your body, your stomach, your abdomen, your lungs. Try to become aware of the inside of your body. And then I would like you to focus on your right arm. And just try as best you can to become aware of the flesh inside your right arm, to become aware of the muscles, the veins, the blood vessels, to try to become aware of the flesh in your right arm. And then let's move down to the right leg and try to become aware of the flesh in your right leg, the muscles, the veins, the blood vessels, the fleshy part. And then let's move over to the left leg. Try to become aware of the flesh in your left leg, sensing as best you can. And then moving up to the left arm, try to become aware of the flesh within your left arm. And then moving your attention, try to become aware of the flesh in your buttocks, your pelvic region. Slowly moving up into your lower back, your abdomen, to your middle back, your solar plexus, midriff, moving up to your upper back, your chest. Try to become aware of the flesh within your torso, recognizing that all of your major organs, like your heart, your liver, your gallbladder, your kidneys, your stomach, are all made of flesh. They're all part of that fleshy part to you. And then become aware of the flesh in your neck. And then moving up into your head, become aware of the flesh in your head, your tongue, your eyes, the skin, your cheeks, the muscles, perhaps even try to become aware of the flesh within your brain. Try to become now aware of all of the flesh in your body. Try to sense your flesh self. Try to sense this part of you. And then, again, return your awareness to your right arm. And this time, I would like you to go a little bit deeper. Try to become aware of the bones in your right arm. There's a single bone in your upper arm. There are two bones in your lower arm. There are all sorts of bones in your hands. And then move down to your right leg and try to become aware of the bones in your right leg. The thigh bone, the two bones in your lower legs, you know, your ankle bones, your 
the bones in your feet, your toe bones. Try to become aware of your bones. And then move over to your left leg and try to become aware again of the bones in your left leg. Upper leg, lower leg, feet. Try to become aware of all of the bones. And then moving up to your left arm, try to become aware of all of the bones in your left arm. The upper arm, lower arm, hands, fingers. Try to become aware of all of the bones. And then move your attention to the base of your spine, your hips, your pelvic bones. Try to become aware of all of the lower bones, your pelvic bones, your hip bones. Try to become aware of your spine. Try to become aware of your spine, moving up your spine, becoming aware of the top of your spine, becoming aware of your shoulder blades, those large flat bones in your upper back. Try to become aware of your breastbone. Try to become aware of your rib cage. And then move up into your cervical vertebrae and try and become aware of your neck bones. And then moving up into your head, try and become aware of your jaw bone. Try to become aware of the upper facial bones where your upper teeth are. Then try to become aware of the occipital bone, the plate in the very back of your head the temporal bones, the plates on the sides of your head, the parietal bone, the plate on the top of your head, and the frontal bone, the plate just behind your forehead. And try to become aware of your bone self. Try to become aware of all of the bones within your body. And then again, allow your attention to rest. And this time, I would like you to move deeper within, into the marrow. Now we have two types of marrow. We have yellow marrow that produces white blood cells, and we have red marrow that produces red blood cells. The white marrow are generally found in our long bones, which means our limbs. So I would like you to try to become aware not of the smaller bones in your hands and fingers and whatever, but try to become aware of the long bones in your right arm. Try to become aware of the yellow marrow in the long bones in your right arm. Then try to become aware of the yellow marrow in the long bones in your right leg. Try to become aware of the yellow marrow in the long bones in your left leg and the yellow marrow and the long bones in your left arm. Try to become aware of all four limbs, the bones and the yellow marrow deep within the bones in your limbs. And then let's switch to the red marrow in your pelvic bones. The red marrow contained within your spine, the red marrow in your shoulder blades, the red marrow in your rib cage and breastbone, the red marrow in your collarbone, the red marrow in your cervical vertebrae, your neck vertebrae, the red marrow in your jawbone and upper facial bones, the red marrow in the occipital bone in the back of your head, that plate, the temporal bone, those plates in the sides of your head, the parietal bone, that plate at the top of your head, and the frontal bone, the plate behind your forehead. Try to become aware of the red marrow within your head. Try to become aware of all of the red marrow from your pelvic bones up through your spine, your shoulder blades, rib cage, breastbone, collarbone, up through your spine to all of the bones in your head. Try to become aware of the yellow marrow in your arms and legs and the red marrow in your torso, neck, and head. And then just allow your attention to rest. And just try to sense your entire body, flesh, bones, and marrow. And understand that uh, in ancient metaphors, the flesh self was the self 
in world 48, in the mechanical realm. The bone self was the development of the self in realm 24, in world 24. And the marrow self was the, the self in world 12. Within the Bible, they talked about nefesh, the soul in all living things. It's the soul contained within our flesh. Then they talked about gruach, which was the soul that came with the growth and development of the bones. And then they talked about neshama, and these are the Hebrew terms in the Old Testament, that they linked and connected with the marrow deep within our bones. And moving back to Ruach, the, the, the bones, um, another interesting thing is that the Torah is a scroll. It's not a book. And if you open the Torah completely, there will be 248 columns. And the interesting thing is, according to the ancients, we were actually born with more bones, we die with less, but the average number of bones in the human body is 248. This is an approximation. Back in the olden days, they believed that it was a fact. So it's interesting how the Torah itself is 248 columns. We have 248 bones. In the Bible, uh, if you look and do a search for the various terms, such as uh, nefesh, ruach, and neshama, you can learn an awful lot of information about world 48, world 24, and world 12. St. Paul called these different levels soma, psyche, pneuma. So soma, the body, psyche, soul, pneuma, spirit. But uh, soma, body would be also the flesh self. Psyche would be the bone self. And pneuma would be the marrow self. So understand that these are metaphors. These are ways of metaphorically representing a truth, uh, a level of reality. And what I find interesting is how the Gurdjieff teachings mesh with this. So Become aware of the flesh in your body. Become aware of the bones. And do your best to try to become aware of the marrow within your bones. Try to sense these three different dimensions of yourself. And then just allow your attention to rest. And we'll finish with the collected state exercise. As the earth is surrounded by an atmosphere, so too are we surrounded by an atmosphere. But normally our atmosphere is dispersed. It's blowing this way, torn that way. And so try to collect your atmosphere. Keep yourself calm. Keep your thoughts calm. Keep your body calm. Your sensations calm. Keep your feelings calm. Draw your atmosphere towards yourself. Perhaps a meter, meter and a half. Keep it calm tranquil, still. And in a moment, I'm going to count from one up to three. And when I get to three, breathe your atmosphere in. And as you breathe out, imagine something remains, something settles within you. One, two, three. Breathe it in. And as you breathe out, imagine something remains, something of the inner work that we've done remains within you. And then silently, in your mind, repeat after me, may results from this exercise be transubstantiated within me. For my being. And then, you know, come back here. Um, with my weekly group, I really try to challenge them to be present in their body as much as possible. 
I actually have a mindfulness bell that I play in the background. And regardless of what we're doing, if we're doing some kind of inner exercise or we're talking or whatever, when we hear the bell, it's a reminding factor to come back to the sensation of self, to come back to this awareness of my physical body. Uh, I've talked many times in the past about how this is the most important step within the Gurdjieff teachings, but it's a basic step. It's a preliminary step. All of the rest of the inner work, in a sense, is predicated on this ability to be here in my physical body, to be aware of my physical body, to be aware of my body from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head, side to side, front to back, inside out, outside in, to develop what Mr. Gurdjieff called the whole sensation of myself. And that phrase, the whole sensation of myself, comes from meetings with remarkable men. It's a very important term. It's a very important part of the teachings for us to understand. So I would encourage you to try to maintain an awareness of yourself. If you lose it, bring your awareness back to your physical self, back to your embodiment, back to your body. Try to come back to this dimension. Try to hold on to it as long as you can and recognize that it's all related to energy. If your human machine isn't working that well, if there's too much internal considering and identification and too much fidgeting and too much formatory thinking and various different things, you're wasting and leaking energy through all of those activities. And that as soon as you run out of energy, you can't be present anymore. It requires a higher level of energy, and to hold on to this state requires us to learn how to conserve the energy within ourselves. So this is a huge part of the Gurdjieff teachings, um, the ability to exist in our body, to hold on to this physical awareness so that wherever we are, we have this awareness of ourselves. So if we're walking down the street, not only are we aware of the street and where we are, we are in the picture. We are part of our observation. So the part of our observation is our physical body. We can be aware of the sky, the birds, the clouds, the breeze, the smell, the sounds, various different things. But if we're just focused outside of ourselves without this connection to ourselves, we are not a part of our observations. We are not within our observations. And this is very important to be present in our observations. And we do this through the process of self-sensing. So for the remainder of uh, um, this meeting, I'm going to ask everyone, you know, the two of you here, uh, those who may be watching on Facebook, uh, those who are going to be watching later on YouTube to Try to hold on and maintain this awareness of your physical body. And if you lose it and you suddenly realize you lost it, bring it back. Try to hold on to this as best you can. And the less you can do it, the more it means that your human machine needs cleaning and repairing. You know, it's like the tires need balancing and the oil needs changing and maybe you need new spark plugs or whatever. I don't know what new cars are like these days. Um, you need a, a tuna and to begin to observe those places where you need a tuna. Now, I'm going to, uh, you know, the, the last time we had a meeting um, was two weeks ago. Last week we had the time change and I completely missed that. That messed me up. So we didn't have a meeting last week. Um, but I'm going to go through various quotes uh, on the teachings. And they're, they're, these are random order quotes. Um, I've been posting for years on Facebook. So I have a whole list of quotes. And I'm just going to sort of explain random order quotes as they come up 
sort of, and explain them. And if there are any questions and whatever, rather than focusing on specific topics to cover a, a, a wide range of topics. So, um, and I actually have a quote set up here. This is Mr. Gurdjieff quoted in uh, the yellow, the title for it. It will remain only theory unless you learn to understand not with mind, but with body and heart. And this comes from J.G. Bennett's biography, Witness. And this, I believe, refers to a period about 1921, 22. This is when J.G. Bennett first went to the Priore in uh, just south of Paris in France. Um, I believe he was still uh, a member of British intelligence and he was still involved in some kind of formal peace talks and whatever at this point. But so he was a, not, not a kid, but he was still a fairly young man at this point. And he had met Mr. Gurdjieff on quite a few occasions in Constantinople, where he was the chief of uh, military intelligence, British military intelligence in Constantinople, where he got to first meet Mr. Gurdjieff. And then this is his second sort of time of meeting Mr. Gurdjieff. Not his second meeting, because he met him a few times in Constantinople. But this is, you know, after Mr. Gurdjieff went to Germany and France, set up the Priere. This is J.G. Bennett's first meeting with him in something like two years. I arrive on a Saturday night. When the exercises were performed in the same white costumes I had seen in Constantinople, and visitors from Paris were allowed to watch the performance. The exercises consisted of the same rhythmic movements and ritual dances that I had seen before. There were also various demonstrations of telepathic communication that much impressed me at the time. Later, I was shown the tricks by which the results were obtained. There were 25 or 30 Russians and about as many English visitors. There were no French or Americans at the time. And between the Russians and the English, there was very little contact, chiefly owing to difficulties of language. I was fortunate in this respect. When I arrived, Madame de Hartmann received me in an elegant drawing room on the ground floor of the chateau and told me that Georgi Ivanovich, the name by which Gurdjieff was known among the Russians, would see me in that same afternoon speaking Turkish, and J.G. Bennett spoke Turkish. Speaking Turkish, we had no need of an interpreter. He asked for news of Prince Sabahedin and went on almost at once to speak of the very same subject, the distinction of being and knowing that we had left at our first talk at Kuru Cheshmi nearly two years before. I made notes of all of the talks I had with him and can therefore reproduce them fairly accurately after all these years. He said, you already have too much knowledge. It will remain only theory unless you learn to understand not with mind, but with heart and body. Now only your mind is awake. Your heart and body are asleep. If you continue like this, soon your mind also will go to sleep and you will never be able to think any new thoughts. You cannot awaken your own feelings, but you can awaken your body. If you can learn to master your body, you will begin to acquire being. For this you must look on your body as a servant. It must obey you. It is ignorant and lazy. You must teach it to work. If it refuses to work, you must have no mercy 
on it. Remember yourself as two, you and your body. When you are master of your body, your feelings will obey you. At present, nothing obeys you. Not your body, not your feelings, or nor your feelings, nor your thoughts. You cannot start with thoughts because you cannot separate yourself from your thoughts. This institute exists to help people to work on themselves. You can work as much or as little as you wish. People come here for various reasons, and they get what they come for. If it is only curiosity, then we arrange things to astonish them. If they come to get knowledge, we have many scientific experiments that will instruct them. But if they come to get being, then they must do the work themselves. No one else can do that work for them. But it is also true that they cannot create the conditions for themselves. Therefore, we create conditions. I said that I was tired of being as I was and wanted to change. He replied, you must begin at the beginning. You start as kitchen boy, then you will work in the garden and so on until you have learned how to master your body. He asked me how long I could stay, and I said I did not know, as it depended on the peace treaty with Turkey. He did not seem very interested and said, it does not matter, you start now, and we will see. Uh, let me just go back now a little bit. Um, now here. Um, Let's see if I can bring up some tools. Um, learn, whoops. Uh, learn to understand not with mind, but with heart and body. Now only your mind is awake, your heart and body are asleep. If you continue like this soon, your mind will go to sleep and you will never be able to think any new thoughts. This is the state of affair of most people on this planet. Their thinking is just a rearranging of old thoughts into new patterns. He was actually making a very interesting comment about J.G. Bennett here by saying that J.G. Bennett, in his mind, was awake. But he wasn't awake in his body, and he wasn't awake in his feelings. Now, most people are not awake in their minds. I know I've met a, a few people in my life who, they were definitely awake in their minds, but they weren't awake in their bodies and their feelings. And here he's talking about, you know, this threefold path the Institute for Harmonic Development, the development of the mind, body, and feelings. And at this point, J.G. Bennett's mind was awake. He was still sort of a fairly young man in his 20s. But his body and his feelings were asleep. And if right now you are not aware of your body your body has fallen back into that state of waking sleep. Most people spend their entire lifetimes in this state of sleep. And it's interesting that me I may have to um, not be able to think any new thoughts. Mr. Gurdjieff says after the age of 18, for a lot of people, thinking is just moving around old thoughts. And it may seem like a novel combination, but sort of like a book where you cut and paste paragraphs without writing anything new. Um, this is the normal state of humanity. People do not think new thoughts. They do not have 
new ideas and they especially do not have new understandings. So this is also indicative of uh, the challenge that Mr. Gurdjieff faced. In Western Europe in the 1920s, people thought they were their thoughts. I think, therefore I am. They were completely dead to their body. Now there's a greater interest in mindfulness and somatic healing and all sorts of stuff. Now the soil is much better prepared for teachings like this than back in the 1920s. Mr. Gurdjieff, you know, there he was in Western Europe and everyone around him was asleep. And occasionally people would come into his circle of orbit who may have had a certain degree of awakening within their mind but because they didn't learn the importance of sensation of the body and of the feelings, they were asleep at that level. And so he had to do whatever he could to wake them all up. He, he basically had to start with a very low level of humanity and work on them and work on them and work on them. And then here again, um, You cannot awaken your own feelings, but you can awaken your body. So the first step, as I just mentioned earlier, is to self-sense. It's to become aware of our body. It's to bring awareness, that awareness into our body. To And by becoming aware of our body, we are awakening our body. And it's interesting here as well, um, if you can learn to master body, you will begin to acquire being. Um, at the level of hydrogen 12, let me just uh, step out of this for a second. I'll get rid of whoops. Um, now I may have messed myself up just a second. I'll just jump out and jump back. Um, the food diagrams. It has been said that uh, this represents being. This over here on the right represents conscience. And this represents consciousness. Um, let me just... I know if I do something, I'm going to, I'll try, whoops, and there I've done it. Let me stop sharing again, um, bring it back up. Um, so at the level of the awakened state, it has been said that being is the physical dimension of being awake. Conscience is the emotional dimension of being awake, and consciousness is the intellectual or um, uh, uh, octave of impressions element of being awake. So to be conscious, and to use the word conscious in these teachings, is a head-brain phenomenon at the level of the awakened state, which is hydrogen 12, which is the level of the awakened human the solar level. For the emotions at that level, it is conscience. And for the physical body, it is being. So the way we develop being, and let me just stop this, the way we develop being is we begin to flood our body with the energy of attention. We become mindful of our body. We sense our body as one organic whole. We sense our body as deeply as we can. And as we sense our body, we are actually acquiring being. We are growing that aspect. But we don't want to just grow being. We also want to grow conscience and consciousness. We want to grow in a harmonious fashion. But we begin with the body. And this is the most important first step. Um, for this, you must look on your body as a servant. Now, one of Mr. Gurdjieff's aphorisms is do what it 
does not like. And it has led to a lot of confusion because it is a pronoun and it, it's non-specific in the nature of the sentence. That we don't know what it refers to, but in that quote, it is really referring to the physical body. Um, one of Mr. Gurdjieff's uh, in Beelzebub of Tales, um, being Obligonian strivings is to give the body everything it needs for healthy existence. So this is not torturing the body. This is not depriving the body of what it needs. So you've got to make sure that you give your body exercise. You've got to make sure that you feed it, you know, foods with active elements and active ingredients. So this is not to harm the body, but to view the body as a servant. It must obey you. You must teach it to work. If it refuses, can I hold this up? Um, so if it refuses, you must have no mercy on it. Remember yourself as to you and your body. When you are master of your body, your feelings will obey you. Most of our feelings are somatically based. You know, our feeling circuits and everything are found within our body. So we begin with the body. We begin the work with the body. Um, we just move down. At present, nothing obeys you, not your body, nor your feelings, nor your thoughts. You cannot start with thoughts because you cannot yet separate yourself from your thoughts. So this is where most people in this world are, as when they think they, that's where they are, they're not able to detach and become the witness, witnessing their mind thinking. Uh, I know that within Buddhism, within the Buddha's great discourse on mindfulness, becoming mindful of our thoughts is right towards the end. At first, uh, the Buddha says, become aware of the air flowing in and out of your nostrils. And then become aware of your lungs breathing. Then become aware of your body breathing. Then become aware of your body uh, like a bag of skin. And the Buddha starts by really orienting people to this awareness, this awakening of their physical body. And only at the end of that great discourse in mindfulness does he begin to talk about you know, the mindful awareness of our thoughts and moving to that level because it is such a challenging task. So starting with the body. And then here he goes on the next paragraph to, you know, the Institute. People come here for various reasons. Some people come for knowledge. You know, some people come to be astonished. So, you know, he, he realized that not everyone who came to see him were genuine seekers, but those who were genuine seekers came for being. And here he said, then they must work on themselves. I don't know why my little thing isn't appearing again. Um, at any rate, then they must do the, they must do the work for themselves. I cannot make you become aware of the baby toe on your left foot. I can talk about the baby toe on my left foot. I can become aware of the baby toe on my left foot. I can become aware of the flesh and perhaps even the nail and the tininess and how it's touching the fourth toe. I can describe it. And hopefully from my description, you can become aware of your baby toe on your left foot but I can't make you or help you do that no one else can do this inner work for you no one can say I'm going to become aware of your breath and the sensation of air as it flows in and out I cannot become aware of your breath at the sensation level I perhaps can observe it I can become aware of the sensation of my own breath the air that flows in through my nostrils, nasal passage, back of mouth, throat, down 
through my windpipe into my lungs and back out again. So the actual work on being, which starts with the physical body, is something that we can only do for ourselves. As Mr. Gurdjieff says here um, at the Institute, they cannot uh, do that. All they can do is create conditions. Here, J.G. Bennett, you know, was saying that he was tired of living as he did. And Mr. Gurdjieff, you must begin at the beginning. Um, start as a kitchen boy. Then work in the garden. Learning to do these things to master your body. Um, we live in such a, an intellectual head brain sleep state in the West, in our society, people are not in their bodies. And so here he's giving, you know, go out into the garden and start digging and go and start doing things with your physical body. Get down on the floor and scrub the floor and observe your body. Do your best to befriend your body, but to recognize it as your servant but it's a faithful servant. It's a loyal servant. Wherever you go, your body is always with you. You go to sleep at night and you wake up and it's with you in the morning, but we rarely give our body any kind of thought and even less attention unless our body's aching or we're hurting. And it all begins with the body. It begins with developing the sensation of Self, or as Mr. Gurdjieff said, the whole sensation of myself. Um, let me go on to the next quote. A or Araj, Araj Gurdjieff meeting notes. Being effort is the only method of developing. Being connected to the body. Um, being effort is the only method of developing. When you are aware you are aware when you have made an effort, when you have done something that you are aware required effort. Every successful effort adds, every failure subtracts. Oops. An effort that involves ample reward is no good. It must be gratuitous. St. Paul said always to be running in the great race. Gurdjieff says always in a huff. Every effort creates energy and at the same time, intrinsic strength. Everything develops by exercise. Pondering exercises the whole mind. You work physically until you drop. Then beyond this, you are using being effort. Everyone lives on his first win. Create or find the conditions where you voluntarily proceed to your second win. Try to discover when you have reached the second wind. Then within the realms of common sense, repeat this. So um, keep in mind that in uh, the early 1930s, Mr. Gurdjieff went to New York. He observed uh, the Orage groups uh, that Mr. Uh, that uh, or Orage set up. And he talks about this in one of his books where he um, uh, dismissed them all, so to speak, and said that they had developed and started to develop a peculiar abnormality. And so even though Oraj was one of his star students, Oraj still had things, you know, that he had to learn. And one of Mr. Gurdjieff's conditions, he reformed reconstituted the groups, and then he made people sign a document that they would have nothing to do with A.R. Oraj. And Oraj heard about this. He went to New York, and he sat down, and he signed the document. And I thought that was, you know, a wonderful example of, uh, you know, he was a fairly developed being. And he also knew that he hadn't had enough training. Mr. Gurdjieff said, go to New York, set up groups. And he kind of felt like a fish out of water but he went and did what he was ordered to do. So um, a Orage meeting notes. Uh, so these 
are notes that were made by his students, Oraja's students, of Oraja's meetings. Um, so being effort, to make an effort. Here he's talking about the power of effort, the power of intent. And every successful effort adds, every failure subtracts. That last sentence, I have to say I disagree with that one. Um, the important point is to make the effort, to try to hold on to perhaps an awareness of your entire body as one organic whole for as long as you can. And you're going to fail. A thought is going to come to your mind. Someone's going to walk by. Something's going to distract your attention and pull you away from this awareness. That doesn't mean that this effort's a failure. It doesn't mean that we have lost all of the results of this attempt. On the contrary, we can learn more from our failures, more from things not being quite successful. You're aware of your body. You're holding on to your body. You have the sensation of your body. You're aware of your body from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. And then suddenly a neighbor starts screaming and you lose it. You can ask yourself, what was it? within the neighbor screaming that made me lose it? What disrupted this focus on myself? Or perhaps a thought came into your mind. You know, one of the formatory, one of the thoughts of the formatory apparatus. Or perhaps you suddenly found yourself getting annoyed or something. Um, if you can find that moment when you lost that awareness and if you can try to figure out what it was that distracted your attention, that captured you, you can learn something about yourself. You can learn something about those parts where your own human machine is not working properly. Perhaps it indicates you need an oil change, or perhaps you need to rotate your tires, or perhaps you need to grease the gear shaft or whatever. Because um, we're all broken in different ways. And so even those being efforts that don't succeed because we can't maintain that state can teach us an awful lot about ourselves. An effort that involves ample reward is no good. It must be gratuitous. St. Paul said always to be running in the great race. Gurdjieff says always in a huff. Every effort creates energy at the same time, intrinsic strength. And here he, um, one thing about Araj, before he met Mr. Gurdjieff, he had studied, you know, various parts of Hinduism, the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata, um, some of their holy books and stuff like this. And any effort that involves ample reward is no good. In other words, we're not going to do any being effort that we do to get something. If we get something, it doesn't help to grow our being. These must be done uh, within Hinduism. There's a concept or a technique or a process called karma yoga, which is to act without the desire for the fruits of one's actions. And basically that's what he's talking about here. That, you know, we must act simply to act, not because our actions are going to bring us a reward. And so although in this quote here, he's talking about the reward that we will grow our being through being efforts and we will, something will form within ourselves. We're not supposed to do it to achieve anything. We're supposed to do it to just do it. And this is the essence of karma yoga where, you know, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, 
Arjuna was a chariot, uh, Arjuna was a prince, and uh, Krishna, the avatar of God, was his charioteer. And Arjuna was a kshatriya, he was a warrior, and a warrior is supposed to fight and defend his people. Um, not necessarily to win, not to conquer, not to do all of that. He's supposed to fight to defend his people without looking for any kind of reward. It is his duty. He, he must do that. And so Krishna instructs him on this, how to act but not to care or be concerned about the fruits or rewards of your actions. So you know, if you go for a 10-mile walk and you start faltering at 9 miles and then you make yourself walk for 12 or 13 miles, Rather than focusing, I'm growing my being, I'm doing this for myself, it's much more important just to do it, to leave that reward, you know, the, the head brain calculations and stuff aside and just to do it. Um, everything develops by exercise. Pondering exercises the whole mind. And I don't know, uh, a number of you have probably read uh, the various exercises by Oraj, basically for developing the mind. And when Mr. Gurdjieff dissolved uh, Oraj's groups in the 1930s, he said it was because of something in the forehead, which is where the prefrontal cortex is. And um, the inference was that Oraj put too much an emphasis on these mental gymnastics and these mental exercises and that his students took that portion of the work very seriously where we should have begun with the body. We should have become with the sensation of self. Now here in the last paragraph, he really gives uh, a definition of tapping into the higher accumulator. You work until you work physically until you drop, and then beyond this, you are using being effort. Here, everyone lives on his first win, and so we try and create those conditions where we proceed to the second win. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff didn't make a you know huge deal out of it, but he said one of the more important higher to mellow higher developments within this work is the ability to tap into the higher accumulator. And the only way we can tap into the higher accumulator is to put ourselves in a state where we can't take another step and then to take another step and another step and another step and to keep on walking. And we will find that reserves of energy can flood back into us. And this is a very key concept within the teachings, even though it's not really emphasized a lot, but the ability to harness, the ability to tap into the higher accumulator. Um, moving on to, uh, I love this quote. John Toomer was, um, he was, uh, what they called a Negro writer, um, part of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, technically, I think Toomer had as much white blood as he had black blood. But, you know, someone who's half white, half black, they're considered black. Um, Toomer was a student of his. Uh, Toomer had sort of a very interesting background. He was a bit of a novelist, part of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, he also, after Mr. Gurdjieff died, he got into Scientology for a while and various different things. Um, and he sort of went into Mr. Gurdjieff's orbit and then pulled himself away and back in and away. And uh, so this is his quote. Earlier this evening, Gurdjieff had said something extreme, some extremely interesting things, which threw light on his apparently shameful conduct during the past months. The gist of what he said was this, that in order to restore himself, particularly his body, it was necessary that he suffer. In order to suffer, he had deliberately done things to people 
and situations which would enter into his automatic process and of themselves cause suffering and make him suffer whenever he remembered them. An amazing idea and amazing intention. Let me just see if I can shrink this slightly so we can get it all in here. Um, so those of you who know about some of the behavior of Mr. Gurdji, the way he treated some people, how he could seemingly go into fits of anger and rage and, you know, how he could treat some people really badly. I believe that there were two things involved in this. One was he was teaching people to stop internally considering, how could he do this to me? How could he say that to me? I thought I was a student. And, you know, a lot of people, when you're yelling at them, they're internally considering. And there's one story of him just raging at A.R. Araj, and then suddenly Oraj getting it and not reacting. And in that moment of not reacting, Mr. Gurdjieff changed in that instant and became normal. And, you know, um, there are stories from Thomas the Hartman, the same <clears throat> thing, various other people, uh, Michelle <clears throat> Kange, Kange uh, the same thing, where these were all pressure. Mr. Gurdjieff pushing himself on people to get them to stop internally considering that, you know, it's a very important tool, a very important teaching for those people. But Mr. Gurdjieff was saying to Toomer that sometimes he went above and beyond what he had to do. And he really, really stepped on people's toes, poked them in the eye, did things to themselves and he was doing that, as he told Toomer, to harness the suffering that remorse of conscience would cause to arise within him. And he was doing it to restore himself, particularly his body. So Mr. Gurdjieff had learned how to harness the power of suffering to begin to rebalance his body, to bring himself back into health. Uh, there were periods, for instance, through the 1930s, even the 1940s, where people would see Mr. Gurdjieff and they would think that he was ready to die. And then the next time they saw him, he would be completely rejuvenated. And... You know, was this his acting? Was it, you know, what he called plastics? Or did he somehow really, truly learn to harness the suffering that arose in him when he stepped on all sorts of people's corns and upset them? At any rate, it's uh, about five minutes to noon. Um, I have someone coming uh, at one o'clock. I'll have to get ready. Any questions? Any comments on some of the things we've said today any questions we can start with next meeting perhaps i have a comment maybe hopefully pretty quick um when you're reading the part from mirage about um successful efforts and, and failures and efforts and whatnot uh kind of coincidentally i, I had been sitting with my legs crossed and I, just as he started reading that i put them on the ground and uh, my left leg was completely asleep and I <laughs> sort of trying to scoop myself up in my chair and my right leg lifted, you know, lifted my hips up fine. And my left leg went to lift and just completely failed and like fell. <laughs> and there was this feeling of my controls slipping and dropping away and me not even being like not aware of how much I was identified with that control and when it just disappears like that it sort of left me hanging um and i, I don't know it was, it was sort of a <laughs> successful effort and an unsuccessful effort and no, then, well, well, I mean, that's a that's a successful effort that's like a home run what you did there just in terms of the ability to observe all of it 
Um, oh, I've crossed my legs and then my leg is numb. And then, you know, the whole sequence of events, just the, the awareness that your left leg was numb and it wasn't behaving properly. And it had gone to sleep in a very real way, more so than most people. You know, the, the sleep for them, you know, their lower legs is they're just not aware of their lower leg. For you, it was, you know, your, your, your right leg must have been pressing on the nerve of the left leg. But just also to realize that, you know, when you did that and the left leg didn't really respond properly, um, to me, there's a gold mine of observations in that split second of just realizing that and you know it was like your body is saying you want a metaphor for this here we'll show you <laughs> uh yeah no that was really interesting good good one uh, uh brian have you you do the martial arts and all of that yeah uh, one of the goals of martial arts not explicit but one of the implicit is to push to activate the higher accumulator to push you to that place of exhaustion um do you know that very well yeah now that i was actually going to say i was just thinking about how to say it um is recently i've been stepping up the training more than i ever have and i've even sometimes i go from uh muay thai training directly to jujitsu training and um it's uh, when he said that that the body is lazy and you have to control it and make it do what it wants to do, um, there's been some times where you know I go from, uh, from one to the other and I get a little bit tired on the drive. I'm like, I really don't want to go to this one right now, but I tell the body that it has to do it. And there hasn't been one time where I've left training where I wasn't happy that I went. You know, every time I'm just like so happy that I made the decision to go instead of not go and stay home. When there's times, you know, you kind of sore, you get a little beat up sometimes and you want to just skip this one. But I just tell myself, get in the gym um, and the body does it. And every time it's like the body thanks me. You know, it's like, thanks for pushing me to go do that. I feel much better now. I feel myself getting stronger. I feel myself getting more skilled and, um, I'm just seeing benefits all over the place. Um, what about the second wind? Uh, do you have much experience with that? Yeah, I mean, sometimes the whole training session is a second wind, but there's other times where if, if you're doing sparring or if you're rolling on the mats, you know, we'll sometimes do five rounds and, you know, I'll skip this last round. I'm completely exhausted, but it's the same thing. If you, every time I push myself to do one more round or, um, <laughs> You know, one more set, not only to go to the class, but even just a small subsection of the class. I'm always thankful I do it. Like there's never one time where I, I push myself too hard. It's like that second wind is where the real growth comes in. Uh, that's a wonderful quote to end on. That second wind is uh, where the, you know, your quote there. It's wonderful. Um, that's, wh that's where we've got to find that line. And you don't have to do it all the time like you do with martial arts. Um, but most people don't ever physically push themselves beyond that point. And it's great that you have the opportunity to do that all the time. Um, at any rate, it's uh, noon uh, here in Toronto. Um, it's a beautiful day out there. It was uh, minus one. Um, that's uh, Celsius this morning, which is about 30 degrees Fahrenheit. But it's supposed to warm up today. Hopefully spring is on the way. I'm sure it's nice and warm there in Phoenix. What's the weather like in uh, Portland? Uh, just rainy? Uh, it snowed yesterday quite a bit. Snowed yesterday. Oh, I'm glad it hasn't snowed up here for a while. Okay. Uh, okay, gentlemen. Um, talk to you next week. Take care. Bye now. Um,